Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you so loved the world that you gave your only begotten Son. And Jesus, we thank you that you willingly humbled yourself, took on the form of a man, became obedient even unto death. We thank you, Lord, that you took our place, that we, the guilty, might be set free. And Jesus, we thank you that the grave could not hold you, but you rose again triumphantly. And you are alive today to give your life to all who will put their trust in you, that we might receive your power and your enabling, and that it might be no longer I who live in weakness and sin and failure, but Christ who lives in me, the hope of glory. We praise you, Lord God, for this glorious hope. We praise you for your plan of salvation and for the work that you've done in our lives. And this morning, as we look into your word, we ask that you would further open our eyes and cause us to respond with joy and rejoicing thanksgiving and praise for your mercy and your goodness toward us. Lord, I pray that our eyes would be open to better understand what it is that's transpiring in our world around us today and what it means. And Lord God, I pray that we would be faithful uh, to fulfill our purpose here on earth, to make you known, to glorify you on this earth, and to point the way of salvation. And I just ask your blessing now upon uh, the remainder of this time together. I ask you to speak through me. I depend upon you, Lord. I yield myself to you and ask you to have your way in me, in each of us. And it's in the name of Jesus I pray. Amen. In today's passage that we're going to be spending some time looking at, uh, focusing on verses 13 to 25, uh, we have here uh, a spiritually, theologically rich drama that is playing out. And it's illustrating for us what is taking place between Jesus Christ and mankind as the Lord approaches the crucifixion. We will see ourselves portrayed in this drama, either as one of the people in the crowd calling for Jesus' crucifixion, or you can choose to see yourself portrayed as Barabbas. Uh, you can choose where you want to be. And I urge you to choose to take the role of Barabbas. Luke 23, verse 13. Then Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people, said to them, You have brought this man to me as one who misleads the people. And indeed, having examined him in your presence, I have found no fault in this man concerning those things of which you accuse him. Gathered before Pilate on this occasion are representatives from all of the Jewish society, the entire nation, to witness this trial and the judgment that would be passed on Jesus. The chief priests, the religious leaders, and the common people are all there. The fact that the lay people are participating in this false charge against Jesus uh, is a dramatic and rapid reversal of public attitude. For it was just less than a week, Palm Sunday, uh, a week earlier, that Jesus' popularity was soaring as the multitudes cheered him as he uh, came receiving a hero's welcome into Jerusalem, riding on a young donkey, and they shouted to him, Hosanna, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. And just a day or two earlier than this, in Luke chapter 22, verse 2, the chief priests and the scribes were seeking to find a way to put Jesus to death, but they wanted to do it secretly because they were afraid of the people who were fans of Jesus, supporting him. But as we've already noticed, uh, when the time was right in God's sovereign plan, 
as Jesus was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane and said that the hour is at hand, the time had come, when the time was right in God's plan, Jesus agreed in that garden to take from the Father the bitter cup of God's wrath which was against our sins and to drink it himself, taking our place and our guilt. Look with me to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew's Gospel, 26th chapter, and verse 42. Jesus prayed in the garden, and he was saying, O my Father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. Here was this offer being extended to Jesus. It was the reason that he came to earth to take our place, to take our punishment, But here the hour had come, the cup of God's wrath is being extended to Jesus and he agrees to take it because there is no other way. The cup that Jesus spoke of was the cup of God's wrath, a metaphorical way of describing God's wrath and judgment against the sin of the world. The sinners of the world were to drink this judgment of God, but Jesus is agreeing to take it himself in our place. How the wrath of God works is illustrated for us in Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, turn with me there. And we're going to look at verses 18 through 28. The wrath of God is portrayed as God giving people over, turning people over, relinquishing people over, uh, phase by phase, step by step, increasingly giving people over to experience the consequences of their choices in the form of God allowing increased evil to come in as God steps back. Now, we've talked about this often here, but as we're leading up to the cross of Jesus, up to his crucifixion, it's important for us to understand what is happening And we look at Romans 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So the wrath of God is revealed. It's a present happening against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who are suppressing the truth. That's what's happening there before Jesus. They're suppressing the truth. Look at verse 21. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful. But, now here's what happens. Note the progressive worsening of their condition. But they became futile in their thoughts. This is... What happens when you reject God? This is the beginning of the wrath of God coming upon man. They began, became futile in their thoughts, and it gets worse. Their foolish hearts were darkened. They have less light. They can see less. They understand less. Verse 22, professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image. Verse 24, Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts. So here God is turning them over, giving them up, stepping back, letting darkness and sin and corruption come in. He's giving them over to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. And so here's the further disintegration, the further wickedness coming in as as God pulls back, as God gives them over, as God relinquishes a measure of his preserving grace in the lives of society that is rejecting him, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie. Verse 26, for this reason God gave them up to vile passions. Here again. Another step, another progression. For even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful. This 
rapidly increasing sexual immorality is one of the stages of God's wrath that we see coming upon our land. Verse 28, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. And so, wrath of God is God letting go and letting the consequences of sin come into a person's life, come into a society, come into a nation, come into a world. And it progressively gets worse and worse as man uh, resists and rejects the Lord. Now what Jesus was doing here as he is standing on trial, coming out of that garden of Gethsemane, he has agreed to become the sin offering for all of mankind. He has agreed to have all of our sin placed upon his head and then to experience all of God's wrath and God's punishment against our sin as he suffers in our place as our substitute. And what we're seeing unfolding here as he makes his way to the cross is God is withdrawing and withdrawing and withdrawing his presence uh, from his son who has taken our place and in the place of God's grace is coming in wickedness and coming in evil and coming in darkness and it is coming in and closing in upon Jesus Christ and as we saw earlier it's it's going to culminate at the cross as Jesus finally cries out my God my God why have you forsaken me The instructions in the Old Testament were that when a guilty party sinned, you were to bring a sacrificial animal to the temple and you were to lay your hands on the head of that sacrificial animal while the priest slit its throat and killed it. This symbolized an exchange was taking place. The innocent animal was receiving your sin and your guilt and dying in your place while you were receiving its innocence and escaping death. And now Jesus was already beginning to experience the punishment for our sins as the presence of God is withdrawing and evil coming in and therefore as the preserving grace of God which had protected Jesus and which had softened the hearts of the multitudes towards him and was drawing them to him is being withdrawn from the nation, the true nature of the hearts of the people is now being exposed. Those who had excitedly hailed Jesus as king are now suddenly repulsed by him and want to see him God gone. They're suddenly, this is something that takes place all of a sudden. Why this national change of mind, this national change of heart? As we saw when the soldiers were beating Jesus, We continue to see in this passage today as we move closer to the cross the true sinful nature and inclination of the heart of mankind is revealed as God is stepping back from his son and stepping away from him who has all of our sin on himself. And they're allowed to have their own way against Jesus. In these last days in which we are living in the world today, as God once again begins to withdraw his preserving grace from this world in preparation for judgment when he will once again uh, come to this earth, we are seeing a dramatic and rapid shift in public attitude, turning against Jesus, turning against Christians, turning against all that is associated with him. Passage of scripture that... I came across this the other day, Psalm 92, verse 7. Look at it with me, if you would. Psalm 92, verse 7. A very sobering statement here that explains what is developing in our world today. You can't turn on the news today without seeing everywhere in the world things are, are falling apart. Psalm 92, verse 7, 
when the wicked spring up like grass, and when all the workers of iniquity flourish, it is that they may be destroyed forever. God allows wickedness to come in that judgment may come upon it. This slanderous, false accusation of the Jews that is coming against Jesus, claiming that he was perverting or misleading the nation, leading the nation astray, inciting them to rebel against Rome and to not pay taxes to Caesar. And instead of Caesar, Jesus was setting himself up as king and that he was stirring the entire nation from Galilee on south with rebellious teaching. That is the accusation that's being leveled against Jesus True followers of Jesus Christ who teach the word of God are increasingly accused today of misleading the people and jeopardizing their welfare with harmful Bible-based teachings. And so the crowds, the multitudes today are once again pushing hard to get all traces of Christ and the Bible out of our schools, out of our governments, out of our public life. You see the repeat of this pattern. And what is it evidence of? It is evidence of the wrath of God encroaching as the Lord withdraws. And why is this happening? He is preparing the way for judgment. Pilate had publicly examined Jesus with his accusers present. It was a legal judicial council. And he could find no evidence that Jesus was guilty of any of these charges that had been brought against him. Back in Luke chapter 23, verse 14, Pilate says, I have found no fault in this man concerning those things of which you accuse him. No, neither did Herod, for I I sent you back to him. Or in some translations, he sent him back to us. And indeed, nothing deserving of death has been done by Jesus. Now, what makes this trial so unusual is that two verdicts of innocence have already been rendered and one more is coming, but Jesus still remains in Roman custody. He still remains on trial. Why? Something unusual, something spiritual in nature is taking place here, strongly influencing Pilate and guiding him in a certain direction to the cross. Pilate and Herod have both found Jesus innocent. Pilate wants to set Jesus free, but there are forces at work ensuring that Jesus is not released, but that he is crucified. Verse 16, Pilate goes on to say, I will therefore chastise him and release him, for it was necessary for him to release one of them at the feast. That's the feast of Passover. Uh, It was a customary practice as an act of goodwill and appeasement for the Roman governor to release a Jewish prisoner at the time of the Passover uh, celebration. So Pilate thought he would take advantage of this custom as a convenient reason to release Jesus. But he suggests that rather than crucifixion, he would chastise or flog Jesus and then release him. Flogging was a a severe whipping, using a whip with sharp metal uh, bits embedded in the tip of the whip. Now, this was a serious violation of Roman justice, which prided itself on being even-handed, equitable, and fair. But note verse 17, um, I, I will hand him over, I will hand Jesus over after I've whipped him. In verse 18, they all cried out at once, saying, and notice they all, they all, and it's an immediate response, cried out at once, away with this man and release to us Barabbas, who had been thrown into prison for a certain rebellion made in the city and for murder. Barabbas was a a Jewish zealot, uh, a guerrilla warrior, who was in prison for committing the same crime 
ironically, that Jesus was accused of, uh, stirring up insurrection, stirring up rebellion in the city. And in addition, Barabbas was a murderer. He was convicted of these crimes. Both of these crimes were punishable by death, and so Barabbas was in prison awaiting his death penalty, which likely was crucifixion. However, the people preferred and demanded the release of a a clearly more dangerous man than Jesus. When God begins withdrawing his preserving presence and his grace from a people and giving them over to their own wicked ways, they become very illogical. How often today on the news do we see our society acting with the same illogical warped delusion of what is good and what is right, preferring that which is dark, preferring that which is evil, preferring that which is uh, corrupt or corrupting in its influence over that which is holy and pure and righteous. We see it, for example, in the illogical releasing from prison of a convicted terrorist and compensating him richly while denying compensation to his victims. We see it when the public illogically demands the rights of people to choose their own gender contrary to their biological gender and to be identified and treated as a member of that gender of choice. Look with me to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 9. The Bible says, the coming of the lawless one, referring to the Antichrist, is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in righteousness. Why is it that a society can so quickly, so suddenly change their, their perspective, change their views of what is right and wrong, what is good and what is evil? How is it that a, an entire society can so suddenly see good as evil and evil as good. How does this change take place so suddenly? The Bible describes it as a strong delusion that God allows to come in to a society that they would believe the lie. Why? That they may be condemned. Brothers and sisters, according to what we see in the scriptures and the prophetic scriptures and in things that we're reading today, and we look at what's happening in the world around us, we need to recognize that God is preparing the way for the second coming of Christ when he's coming to bring judgment on the earth. Um, I make that statement because I see so much of it prophesied in the Bible. I see so much of what the Bible declares playing out before us that I either have to turn a blind eye to what the Bible says and just think things are going to carry on. This is just a little, a little blip in the cycle. Uh, Tomorrow is going to be the same as yesterday and, and it's going to carry on. Or I take God's word seriously and I say we need to heed what God says and we need to act in accordance to what he is saying and recognize that... Uh, Something is unfolding. Something big is taking place at an unprecedented scale in our world. In Jesus' day, they have heard the truth preached by Jesus, but have rejected it. And therefore, God causes them to be deluded so that they will all believe the lie, and they believe it easily, and they believe it quickly, and they are being prepared for... Uh, the judgment, this is taking place as, as God is moving away, stepping away, pulling away from his son who has on him our sin. 
And in the world today, the truth of the gospel has never been more widely accessible around the world. And yet, for the vast majority, they have rejected the good news. Though there are some who still have yet to hear, and we must go while there is time. Therefore, the Lord is sending this world a strong delusion. And all around us, we see them believing the lie. We see them believing all kinds of lies. And this is paving the way for judgment. The same pattern that was playing out in the time of Israel's rejection of Jesus Christ. Luke 23, verse 20. Pilate, therefore, wishing to release Jesus, again called out to them, but they shouted, saying, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate wants some semblance of of justice in his court to prevail, and so he tries again to persuade the crowd, hoping to find a way to get their approval to release Jesus. Pilate, who has followed due legal process, is the judge, and he should be carrying out the justice. But he is acting instead here like a defense attorney, speaking on Jesus' defense while the crowd has taken the role of judge and jury. They have wrongly condemned Jesus as guilty and have determined his punishment. It must be crucifixion, not what the judge has prescribed. And Pilate is going to go along with it, contrary to his conscience. Again, in these last days, we see in the world around us this same dysfunctionality playing out on many fronts. For example, in the American government, it is becoming increasingly impossible to govern that nation peacefully by due political process because of public pressure and opposition. Politicians and courts are increasingly hesitant to act contrary to the vocal opposition of a deluded and manipulated public opinion. But the emboldened emboldened crowd uh, standing before Pilate is almost morphing before our eyes into something hideous, becoming adamant. They want Jesus, the preacher of righteousness, the healer of thousands, the feeder of the multitudes, not merely to die, but to experience the most excruciating form of Roman execution, crucifixion on the cross. This makes no sense at all in the natural mind. But God is stepping back from his son and letting wickedness and darkness in the human heart rise to the forefront and to be seen for what it is. And he is letting all this evil be spewed out against his son who is carrying our sin on his shoulders that he might experience separation from God in our place. And look what transpires as God steps away from his son to all those that are left in that vortex as evil comes rushing into their hearts, comes rushing into the circumstance and the crowd. Verse 22, And Pilate said to them the third time, Why? Why? in response to their cry to crucify him. Why? What evil has he done? I found no reason for death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. But they were insistent, demanding with loud voices that he be crucified. And the voices of these men and of the chief priests prevailed. So Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they requested. Weak leadership, but under demonic power. It is not justice that sends Jesus to the cross, but humanity in mass acting according to their sinful nature. Jesus dies an innocent man with masses of people responsible for his death. In reality, it is the entire human race that is responsible for Jesus' death because he is dying in our place. And this small but influential group of religious leaders have achieved their goal. They have effectively swayed the masses to their position, and together they press hard to get rid of Jesus. Again, we see a similar scenario transpiring in our society. And what makes it similar 
absence of God's preserving grace, uh, vacating as evil comes rushing in. The enemy is rapidly gaining control of the masses, largely through influencing the message of the mainstream media and the education systems. The evil has always been present in our world. There's nothing new, but it has been contained. It has been controlled. It has been regionalized by the preserving work of the Holy Spirit. But this rapid surge of evil rising to the surface all over the world and being publicly expressed all over the world is because the Lord is withdrawing his preserving influence. And we read in verse 25, And Pilate released to them the one they requested, Barabbas, who for rebellion or insurrection and murder had been thrown into prison, but he delivered Jesus to their will. Okay, I said at the beginning, you can choose which character you want to be. You can be the crowd, shouting crucify, or Barabbas, uh, the murderer, the rebel, who is condemned to die. Barabbas represents us who have been saved from our sin. Uh, he represents what we were. And how, how is it that we came to be saved? How is it that we came to be released? Barabbas was truly guilty of those sins that Jesus was falsely accused of. Rebellion, sedition against Rome. Barabbas was guilty. Jesus was innocent. Barabbas was deserving of death. But because Jesus was rejected, Barabbas was pardoned and set free. Jesus deserved to be set free. But he was crucified in Barabbas' place on the cross meant for Barabbas. Look at the meaning of the name Barabbas. Bar, B-A-R, means son of. Abba is the father. So Barabbas means son of the father. The only begotten son of the father came to die in our place so that we who were enemies of God could become children of God sons and daughters of our Father. Because of the substitutionary death of Christ on the cross, God made this promise in Romans 9, 25, and 26, I will call them my people who were not my people, and her beloved who was not beloved, and it shall come to pass, they shall be called sons of the living God. Because an exchange took place. Jesus took my place and I entered into his. Three times Pilate unequivocally declared that Jesus was innocent, undeserving of death. The Bible declares that Jesus was indeed spotless, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus came to fulfill what was only symbolized in the Old Testament by the sacrificial lambs, by the millions of unblemished sacrificial lambs and goats that were slain year after year to temporarily cover our sin. But Jesus came to offer his body the perfect sinless sacrifice that would finally, once and forever, not just cover, but remove all the sin of any who would receive him as their substitutionary sacrifice. The exchange of Jesus, the sinless Son of God, for the prisoner Barabbas was a picture of what Jesus was doing for each one of us. He was taking our place of punishment so that we could become the sons of the Father. And praise God, because Jesus was sinless, because his sacrifice was accepted, he triumphed over sin and death, and the Son of God rose again from the dead on the third day after his crucifixion. So he is alive today, and he offers salvation from sin to any who will put their faith in him and who will follow him. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 27, where we have a little more detailed uh, description of what was happening at this moment 
when Pilate released Barabbas and sentenced Jesus to be crucified. Matthew 27 and verse 24. When Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a tumult was rising, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. And all the people answered and said, His blood be on us and on our children. What a horrific curse to call upon yourself and your children. And then Pilate released Barabbas to them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Now, I love history, and it's fascinating to look at history and see how this self-imposed curse of the, the Jewish people came true against the crowds who had turned against Jesus in Jerusalem and how this curse came upon not only them but their children for generations to follow. All those who participated in the crucifixion of Jesus came to a violent end, beginning with Judas Iscariot, who went out and hung himself. One year later, the high priest Caiaphas was deposed, and the high priest Annas uh, and his entire household were violently destroyed. Herod and Pontius Pilate, uh, the two who had become friends over their roles in the Jesus trial, were both deposed from their positions. Their goods were confiscated, and they were banished to Gaul, which is modern-day France, but in in that day, it was land of the barbarians. And they both died there, Pilate, by committing suicide. And Forty years after the death of Christ, the Romans besieged the city of Jerusalem. And after a lengthy siege, in which many of the citizens died of starvation, the Romans finally broke through the defenses and destroyed the city and destroyed the temple as Jesus had predicted. And Jesus said in Luke 21, 20, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. And he instructed people who would listen to his prophetic voice, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, let those who are in the midst of her depart, and let not those who are in the country enter her, for these are the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled. Those who rejected Jesus ignored his prophetic warning. And something that I am exhorting us as church today, let us not ignore the prophetic warnings of Scripture. But those in Jesus' day who ignored his warning perished. When the Romans destroyed the city of Jerusalem, they erected thousands, thousands of crosses all around the circumference of the entire city upon which they crucified many thousands of the surviving Jews of the city of Jerusalem. Many of them were crucified on the very spot where Jesus had been mocked and scoffed as he hung dying for their sin. Among them were those who had foolishly cried out, his blood be on us and on our children. And historians say that the horrors of the siege of Jerusalem were unparalleled in ancient history. It was something that had never been seen before in its violence. In all, an estimated 1,100,000 Jews were killed by the Romans during the siege of, of Judea and Jerusalem and 97,000, a mere 97,000, captured and enslaved. And for 2,000 years since then, the Jewish people who rejected their Messiah have suffered terribly, as Satan has repeatedly tried to wipe them out. But God is not done with the Jews. God is not done with Israel. Jesus Christ, our Messiah, the Jews' Messiah, is coming again, and he is going to rule and reign the world from Jerusalem. And today we know that Christ is coming soon to judge the world. 
And all who have rejected Jesus will be destroyed. And those who have by faith embraced Jesus as their Lord will be saved and will receive eternal life. And so I invite you today to put your faith in Jesus Christ. First, acknowledge that you are a sinner and that you are deserving of God's wrath. For the Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Second, believe that Jesus Christ has paid the penalty for your sin. He took your place and he is willing to save you from your sin. For God demonstrates his own love toward us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us in our place. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust. This exchange that he might bring us to God. And if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart you, are, you believe and are justified and with the mouth you confess unto salvation. And third, call upon the Lord Jesus for mercy and ask him to make you a child of God. For his word says that for whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so I invite you to call on Jesus to take away your sin, to place yourself in that place of Barabbas and ask that Jesus would set you free and may you not be found uh, anymore in that place of the mocking, scoffing crowd. Lord Jesus, we sang with joy this morning about what you have done and who you are. And Lord, you, you are awesome. You are an awesome God. You are so good. And Lord, apart from you, we are evil to the core. There is none righteous. There is none good. There is none who seeks after God. Apart from you, Lord, we are without hope and we are deserving of your wrath, deserving of that separation, total separation from you and from all of your goodness. But God... I pray that you would fill hearts in this room this morning who are not already made your children fill hearts in this room with desire, with longing. Lord, with a cry in their hearts is, that says, I want to be yours, Lord Jesus. Deliver me from that place of enmity. Deliver me from that place of being one of the scoffers, one of the mockers, one of the rejecters of God and the word of God. Oh, Lord, I pray that you would move on our hearts by your Holy Spirit and cause us to cry out to you. And Father, for those who have cried and those who have been cleansed and those who have been set free and who have been transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of your Son, we give you praise, we give you thanksgiving. How can we ever thank you enough? And now, Lord God, we offer to you our bodies as living sacrifices and say, let it be no longer me and my way, but let it be you, Lord. Have your way in me. Fill my heart with your love for the lost. Fill my, my heart with your motivation and desire to go. And Lord, I pray that you would compel me to trust you for the strength to obey. Send us, Lord, into this world, for the time is short. May we be found faithful when you return. I pray for our church. Lord, I pray that you would have your way in our hearts. Open our eyes to see what's going on around us. And may we be filled with a sense of the urgency of the hour. It is not a time to pursue our own way, but it is a time to follow you. It is not a time to seek our own uh, pleasures and the things of the world, but it is a time to seek the world that they might be saved. And 
I pray that you would work by your Holy Spirit. You have a purpose in what has been said today. May your word accomplish your purpose in each of our hearts. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.